Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to another episode of the DXM podcast. I am Colborn Bell, and I am joined today by artist and programmer John Hauk. John, welcome. Thank you, Colborn. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, absolute pleasure. We're really excited to speak with you today. Uh, we start all episodes in the same place, and that is to give you our guest. Um, please tell us a little bit about yourself and how you came to be here today. Yeah, certainly. I. I'll just give a little bit of biography, I suppose, because that captures, of course, where, where I'm at today. But, um, you know, I started uh, after after college. I got into programming pretty heavily and uh, worked at Sun Microsystems, which, you know, was bought by Oracle. And uh, back in the day, it would be like working for Google. It was just the place to work. So many great engineers. Um, they had a, the four founders of Sun all came from Stanford. So you could take classes at Stanford, no questions asked. I... Um, you know, I worked there five years, and it was essentially like a, a graduate program as well as a job. Uh, it was it was really fun. Um, I took a bunch of classes, and you know, worked my way toward a master master's in computer science. But after about five years of that, I also started to feel like it became a little bit socially isolating to be on mm -hmm. the computer all day long. Um, and I thought, uh, you know, programming would always be there, so why not go to grad school for art? now or uh, actually I decided on architecture because uh, my undergrads in architecture and I, I got into a couple architecture programs and started actually at UCLA and unbeknownst to me I, I didn't realize UCLA was also an amazing art program so I did my first year in architecture I met Jim Welling the photographer and just kind of started going to the Hammer Museum and seeing artists lecture and this whole world opened up of just you know you don't have to wait till you're like 60 years old to have success as an architect. You could be an artist and be more self-directed mm. and um, be, you know, really creative and kind of carve out your own path earlier. There's a lot to be said for architecture, but it, I think it's a much longer road that requires a lot of endurance. Yeah. And I just became completely seduced with the art world and uh, made, made the switch and finished with an MFA. Um, but, you know, I, I've always... Uh, you know, my MFA was unique in that I also was sort of between departments. Like I was in this department called the Design Media Arts Department, where Casey Reese is one of the professors, and I worked intimately with him. And you know, he invented processing, and I did a lot of code-based computational um, design things and computational art. Um, and then I also worked with Jim Welling and Andrea Fraser and people more in the traditional, quote unquote, art world, and uh, had this very and then. I should mention too, the other triangulation of that is I had Tom Main on my thesis committee. So, you know, I've always been sort of um, unwilling to specialize in just one thing. Uh, <laughs> and then, uh, you know, after graduating, UCLA asked me to come back and teach. And I taught in the art department, the design media arts department, and the architecture department as a, a lecturer in all three departments. Um, and then after that, I, I actually got into the Whitney Independent Study Program, and that brought me to New York. And I lived in New York for three years. This was around 2010. And that's really when my art career started. Mm -hmm. um, it wasn't until the Whitney that, that things just really took off for me. Um, you know, I think it was living in New York. It was a big part of that, the Whitney and its connections. So that's where my whole kind of art trajectory started. And, you know, but I, I'll just say along that entire route and up until today as well, like programming, um, while I don't do it professionally full time, it's opened so many doors for me. Um, mm. I worked for Fred Wilson. I worked for Andrea Fraser. I worked for Chris Burden, um, Joan Jonas, really big name artists because I could program. Like it, it was at the time back then, especially it was quite rare for somebody to be able to program and know a bit about the art world. And uh, it was great. I had these amazing jobs where I would work, you know, on just a single project for a, a big name artist. Um, it wouldn't be like I'd be in their studio for years on end. It was just like a, a single project and it gave me a really good kind of survey of the field of contemporary art and how people work. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, perhaps in an increasingly common skill set, but exceptionally rare, somebody that traverses both. Um, and obviously becoming incredibly more relevant as, you know, we continue to transition into digital spaces, digital environments, spend more time online. Um, you know, are there any, let's, let's start back, but are there any, 
like lessons to be gleamed or projects that really inspired you in the beginning that you find particularly relevant or interesting today? Yeah, one that I think about uh, continually is I, um, I was still in grad school at the time, but I, during the summers I would work for Tom Main, the architect. His, his firm is called Morphosis. And he just set me loose as a, a kind of researcher. I was like a think tank of one, basically. And I, d I reported directly to him, the principal of the firm, and um, he just had me programming all sorts of amazing things. Uh, mm -hmm. But one in particular, uh, this, this project never got built, but on Hill Street in Los Angeles, he was building this um, uh, apartment block. Uh, and I set it up in the computer. I programmed this thing, what's called a constraint satisfaction problem. So he basically gave me all the constraints of the project, like paneling is this large. There needs to be this percentage of windows versus paneling. Uh, windows fall within this category. They have to be multiples of this number. Uh, you know, all the kind of constraints one would need for architecture. And then I wrote a piece of software to just, just generate different facades. And, mm -hmm. you know, it could generate any number of facades, but it still had these constraints around it, which is, um, you know, not unlike creativity, uh, you know, people often think it's just an open field and you do whatever you want, but really having constraints around it is, is what can kind of lead to creativity. And um, that project always really stuck out to me as a, as a kind of template for a lot of the other things uh, that I've done um, with programming. Yeah, I mean, that's super interesting because <clears throat> I just have to say with our work at the museum, um, you know, the way we fundraise is that we actually sell one of one architectural objects for people to bring their NFTs into this. So we are concerned a lot with the nature of architecture in digital spaces. Uh, and, you know, we've seen so much implementation of AI, but it hasn't particularly been applied to 3D objects or, or architectures and environments in space. And something I really lament is the fact that so much of this is just two-dimensional JPEG, MP4, um, perceiving it on flat screens. And it's I, I feel that we want to leap into spatial web, and there's not really a question here. Uh, mm -hmm. But I'm just curious, you know, with this background, if it's if it's something that is interesting to you, or what are like is there a room for more digital spaces and environments? And is there, do you think an actual need for spatial web? I, yeah, I mean, I'm super interested in augmented reality. I, I you know, I find, I find virtual reality not so interesting. I'm not really into gaming. I, uh, when I was a programmer, I was always sort of an oddball because, uh, you know, here I was at Sun with these really intense programmers and they, they all read a lot of sci-fi, and not not to essentialize too much what a programmer is, but yeah, there, there is a certain there are certain stereotypes uh, that are stereotypes for a reason, and you know they all read sci-fi, and here I was reading like Raymond Carver, uh, <laughs> minimalist kind of writing about about these heavy drinking. You know, I'm not into that anymore, but that at the time I was just reading very realist kind of um, uh, short stories, uh, Bartholomew, yeah. that kind of stuff, and mm. and here I was programming, and then you know you know, hang out with these people that were really into sci-fi and video games and all of these things. Uh, I don't know what point I'm trying to make with this, but uh, I've always been in this weird, I guess, uh, third position between the digital and the physical. And so for me, you know, I think what Jaron Lanier says about virtual reality uh, in a lot of his books is, is really true. Like, I don't think, for me, that's, that's not so much the future as augmented reality. Like, the blend of the two is, is fascinating. Even just simple stuff like, you know, the Super Bowl now where you see these graphics like as if mm -hmm. they're on the field <laughs> projected in space. Like that's kind of primitive now, but I, but I can imagine a time when that's really going to be just um, a game changer once the physical, your embodied experience can be altered by the digital in a way that's a little more seamless um, rather than just being a totalizing world like a video game. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I agree. I think uh, I think both video games and VR really play into a lot of escapist fantasies. Um, mm -hmm. And I think also the, the narratives of science fiction also kind of play into these things. Uh, the idea of like even going to Mars, like that we have to get out of these things and we can't confront the things that are, are really actually here and in front of us. Um, so it's always a question to me, you know, 
is it inevitable that we will end up in this places? People certainly are, are experiencing, you know, more feelings of depression and loneliness. And but I feel that it's technology that has created this. And if you bring people into these places, perhaps it will uh, continue to do this. But <laughs> if it's inevitable, I would like there to be like beautiful, independent arts and thought-provoking things, and it not be controlled by a place like Meta. Completely. Yeah, yeah I agree 100 percent. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. I, I think the, the physical aspect is so important. You know, the, my, my art career, uh, I would just say, really, really started with to kind of diagram for what we're talking about here. Um, my first body of work are these works called aggregates. And I used software or wrote custom software to generate every combination of a, a grid, um, kind of with the idea that like, the computer screen is a discrete set of colors, like your iPhone, let's say, is a grid of discrete colors. You could calculate every possible combination of color, um, and you'd have every possible photo uh, for that device. Mm -hmm. You know, and I, I thought that was a very unique idea, but of course, many people have have had that thought in computer science, and you know, it would take ten thousand years to make all of those pictures. But I just love the idea that you could algorithmically, in a sense, lay claim to every possible picture for a given screen. Mm -hmm. um, that, of course, I don't have ten thousand years, so I simplified it dramatically and took it down to like a two by two grid with like twenty colors, and then I would generate these kind of index prints of every combination. And you know, I had it hanging in the studio for a while and it just felt really optically charged and interesting, but it wasn't, um, uh, it was too much in the world of the screen purely uh, because it was just a, a pattern of these colors in a grid. And so I had this thought to interrupt that pattern with something subjective. So I folded the paper, photographed it to document it and was like, wow, that's, that's fascinating. Suddenly the fold, now that I photographed it, is flattened back out and it's Trump Loy. And this has become a photograph because there's now light across the surface hmm. of this digital grid. Um, and then I folded it again and repeated this process. And that started a whole investigation of kind of iterative photography. Um, and also, I guess what I'm doing in that iterative photography is taking something very mechanical and systematic like photography, um, like programming, and interrupting it with something subjective, the fold in this case. Um, and yeah, I, I think that way of photographing was so uh, kind of comforting to me too, because it was not unlike programming. Um, you know, you write a few lines of code, you compile it, you see if it works. There's this really immediate feedback loop that happens when you code. And uh, I didn't do this on purpose, but you know, two or three years into making my, my work as a photographer, I was like, wow, I'm actually like coding photographs. <laughs> I'm doing this highly iterative feedback loop of photography um, that I didn't intend to do, but it, given my background, made a lot of sense. But you know, the, the whole time I was trying to throw a wrench in it by folding these things, by, um, you know, other, other strategies happened along the way. Like I got really interested in psychoanalysis and started to draw and paint on the photographic print as part of the rephotographing process. So uh, there's always this tension in my work, I guess, in the way that there is an augmented reality between like a kind of something very systematic, screen-based, computational, and something real uh, and embodied. I feel that there's so much tension and, um, you know, maybe this is at like kind of the core of why art asks questions, why it is in interrogative and it, it brings and raises emotions and different emotions and all sorts of people. Do you feel that, you know, technology is, and all of these, these processes is allowing people to interrogate things more or is you, are you finding it that it's kind of closing people in to be less uh, questioning and interrogative? Yeah, I think I think it could do either, you know. But I but I do think there is. Uh, I've I've done a lot of as a as a patient a lot of psychoanalysis and and you know one of my sort of big discoveries was well there's a few things of course but one is that I I really liked programming because when I was young I played with Legos constantly mm -hmm. and programming is a lot like playing with Legos where the two bricks 
they snap together and there's an answer. And programming is the same way. You know when you're done, it's um, complete in a way. Um, with art, though, there's so many open-ended questions. Like, you don't know mm. when it's done. Um, and as you're pointing out, it, it asks questions. It's not like design uh, where you start with a kind of goal and then you get to a kind of, you get there or you don't and you know if you do and it, it, it's like, um, it's just so open-ended. And I guess uh, along those lines, the thing I discovered in being a, a patient in psychoanalysis for so many years was, um, you know, in psychoanalysis, uh -huh. you're, you're, you're trying to do free association. You're trying to say whatever comes to your mind and it's very spontaneous and with programming, it's a formal language. There's a limited mm. set of words. It's entirely about precision. And when I was programming, you know, like 50 or 60 hours a week um, for five years on end, toward the end of that, I just felt like so in my head, like I couldn't, um, I couldn't say something to somebody without rehearsing it over and over and over. I just got in these kind of loops and I think you know, we, we make this technology and then the technology remakes us. And I do think mm. there is something kind of inherent about the way digital technology works that, yes, could have a kind of effect on one psychically. And so it, I think it's important to remember, like, how do you how do you break out of that kind of loop of, of technology? And for me, it's been psychoanalysis. Like when I can remember, you know, the first sessions trying to <laughs> trying to do free association, it was just so so difficult it still is at times you know there are all these tricks you can do you can talk about a dream you can not face the analyst and lay on a couch there's all these different ways mm. you can get out of that but um i'll just say you know psychically i just feel so much healthier when i can surprise myself you know like this this um psychoanalyst i really like donald winnicott that's his definition of health is really to be able to surprise yourself and i think when i was programming constantly my my life became very um very routine uh let's say mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and so but at the same time you know i found myself during covid such a difficult time in the world and being locked down and or if like things are going if i'm facing really big challenges in my life sometimes programming for me and uh, you know this isn't for everybody of course but for me it's so there's a comfort in knowing that there are answers and that you can solve things and there's like you can make these small steps toward a goal and programming really offers that. Yeah, there's a, there's so much there. I, for one, also played with a ton of Legos as a child, mm. right? And I, I have this same kind of like stacking building. How does everything come together and fit like final form mental model that I consistently operate in? Um, and, you know, we also sit on like the divide of seeing the internet come into the world and like the birth of these algorithms. But I see so many young emerging artists also who only knew the internet and they only knew the algorithms. And I really believe that the, the algorithms train you to be exactly who you were yesterday. Mm -hmm. um, they don't try to take you into places of surprise. No, they want to like comfort you and they want to, uh, you know, they don't aim to surprise because, well, because it, it can bring all sorts of emotions that would want somebody to like disappear. Um, so I, I see that like large, I also know when I'm on the computer too much, the thing I have to do is return and work with my hands and be in something physical. And, and but I also see a lot of young kids who just know the internet, they're kind of, victim to these algorithms they're constantly having to remake themselves in the eyes of the machine to get some sort of attention and there there are i think major like psychological problems and, and damage there precisely yeah no i agree i think you know when i made the aggregates that early body of work i, I was really into this um philosopher he's sort of a moral philosopher bernard stiegler uh he's french uh and he he talks a lot about this very thing he's, he's, he's he calls technology particularly digital technology a pharmacon yeah. so it's both good and bad you know it's 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 neither one or the other it really is both both good and bad and it's important to always be cognizant of that um and he one of the one of the concepts i like very much from him is this idea that as 
the more you use technology, the more it, it repeats in your life. Like, let's say you check your email 10,000 times a day. Like, <laughs> there, there's, there's a complete uh, relationship between checking your email 10,000 times a day and what he calls your libido. Um, mm -hmm. your, your, your feeling for like life force and energy and it goes down as you do that. So, um, you know, I, I think there's a, a lot of interesting people, um, kind of conf confronting that issue, but, but he's one of the first people who, uh, in the world of philosophy brought, brought that to my attention. And, uh, I have noticed, yeah, that that really does make a difference, uh, whether that's through meditation or <laughs> psychoanalysis or some some kind of way of, of getting out of the loop of the algorithm, because you're right, it does it does direct people in a very particular way. And and COVID was, I think, particularly scary for a lot of people because a lot of perhaps the even like physical connections that they had in the real world, even just like going to a a workplace and having whatever rent somebody cuts you off on the road, you know that inspires a reaction. You know something happens in the office that. But then suddenly people are stuck at home where things, of course, are, again, very controlled and there's very few surprises to encounter. Yeah, I was just in L.A. last week for the for Felix and for the Freeze Art Fair. And, you know, I hadn't traveled in a little while and it was just a, a revelation to be around people <laughs> and to see friends. I'm just I mean, I'm so energized and riding so high from that experience. And, uh, you know, apropos of this conversation, though, it was fascinating and I got this sense the last time I was in New York, but in the uh, traditional art world, there's, it's all painting now. I mean, it's all in ceramics. There's, there's no video art. There's no very mm. little photography even. Um, and I don't know if that's a kind of reaction formation to this, the way we have had to leave, live these virtual lives under COVID. Um, but it's, it's pretty fascinating how materially focused the, that part of the art world is right now. <sighs> Yeah, I mean, that's, uh, yeah, it, yeah, you know, I want to say that, you know, like crypto art, NFTs have given, you know, a, a broader audience, perhaps to things like performance art and photography and poetry and begin to like monetize and appreciate the, the people who are creating in this mediums. Um, you know, like just long traditionally neglected art that never really finds its ways into into contemporary galleries. Um, and it's so hard because at the same time we deal with just so much shit. And I, I and and I think that's just the nature of the digital. Uh, and it's going to take, you know, a, a tremendous amount of time for people to like care and sift through. Um, but I'm also very conscious of like people creating art for algorithms. Um, so again, there's just there's just so much there's so much tension, and when you're online, the world does feel so big. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe we want to touch on on more of the works that that you've created. I'd love to just hear about yeah, yeah some of those other interrogations. Sure. So there's sort of three three main bodies of work. Um, I guess I, you know, the the aggregates which I mentioned, and then um, when I really got into psychoanalysis, I, um, you know, was talking a lot about my the relationship with my parents, of course, and they. I was telling them I was in analysis. I was living in New York at the time, and they were living in Colorado, and. You know, my dad coached rodeo at the high school. It was a very rural <laughs> kind of yeah. upbringing, and they didn't. Couldn't quite get their heads around what <laughs> what uh, therapy is, and they were worried, like, "Oh, what's wrong with you? Or what did we do wrong?" It, you know, it it it, it was a big kind of um, and a productive, I think, rupture in our relationship mm -hmm. for them to even know that I was in therapy three days a week. Um, but every time I would see them, like I'd go visit Colorado, they would give me something from my childhood. My mom was like really good at curating objects. Um, and uh, this is a whole other story, but I was born on a Lakota Sioux reservation mm. called Pine Ridge in South Dakota. And my dad, he had a lot of um, Lakota Sioux friends and they gave him objects when I was born and he kept those for me and then started giving me those as well. So I was accruing this amazing archive of kind of um, formative objects from my childhood. And, um, you know, it, it, it was also my, my parents giving me these gifts. It was a, it was an interesting gesture. It was sort of like, 
get this crap out of our house, <laughs> but also <laughs> don't forget you were once our child. Right. Like it, it, uh, it functioned in, in two ways, which I really love. And so anyway, I, I had all these objects. Some of them I was even sort of reminiscing about in psychoanalysis. And I started to photograph those the way I photographed the grids. Um, so, you know, let's say I had like my grandfather's shaving brushes my mom gave me um, and the little jar he kept them in, this beautiful like dimpled glass jar. And so I would photograph those on paper and kind of arrangements, print out that photo so it's the same size it is in real life and then put the object back on top of the photo of itself. So mm. this kind of iterative way of making photos I continued but suddenly kind of took that process toward these objects that had personal significance. Um, and that's this body work I call a history of graph paper. And I made that mm. for, for a number of years. You know, at some point, I simply ran out of objects. Uh, there's like 40 or so of those. It expanded out and I actually started asking friends for objects or mm. there would be certain objects that would remind, remind me of a friend. So these pictures became a kind of like third entity between me and somebody I had a relationship with with in my life. Um, so I made a lot of these iterative kind of still lifes. Hmm. Um, but then I had a show with Marion Boski. This was about three or four years ago in New York. And, you know, it was all photography, but painting had kind of taken over the photos in a way where I was like, you know, making mostly oil on canvas paintings, unstretching them, photographing them with objects, painting on that print and continuing this process. But, you know, I was walking around the show and I was just like, it's an awful lot of work to try to color correct and make an oil painting look good in a photograph. Yeah. <laughs> Why not sort of bifurcate this and have my photo practice, but also oil on canvas painting. So during the pandemic, um, this atelier in New York, Grand Central Academy, put a lot of their classes online in order to stay in business. And I um, thought I would just take a class or two, but I got really, really fascinated with um, basically 19th century French academic painting, <laughs> which is what they teach. Yeah. Um, and I spent, I spent the last, I guess, two or three years really learning how to paint well mm. um, in, in, that, in that way. Of course, within the art world I'm a part of, there's not a lot of that type of painting unless it's done very ironically, like John Kern or somebody. Mm. Um, so now, now my work is really trying to figure out how to use this new kind of power I have of painting in and make it my own and so i'm making these these new new this new body of work uh which will be a solo show have you found that all things kind of return they, they kind of do yeah there, there is always this return of that tension between those two parts of myself yeah the 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 kind of technical systematic part and the other part that wants to break free of that and go out on a limb and mm. <laughs> be a little more wild and let things emerge and be surprised. Yeah. Interesting. So this is where this is where you, your your practice is focusing from now. It is. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, what about? I don't think we've touched very much on you know NFTs or crypto art, but is is there something yeah. within that medium that you you find interesting as well? I think when you uh, spoke to the way that like objects representing and holding like the power of these connections between people that was kind of an early tenant of this as well where like most online interactions felt so fleeting suddenly there was that like immutable uncensorable record that this thing happened um, and that these two parties like you know there was some exchange of uh, you know a token for some you know sense of internet value uh I, I find that fascinating no i do as well i and you know i just haven't i haven't got it quite as into it as much as i would like i i did make um, three nfts and um this was before I, I did a nft 101 talk at sotheby's with a few other people it was a kind of panel discussion and before that i made a few nfts and i was thinking really deeply about it and having all these conversations before that round table and um, you know, I think the thing that was difficult for me, I think if I was in a different phase of my career, I would have embraced it a lot more mm -hmm. having, having two galleries who, you know, one of which has quite frankly, just a, you know, more established older clientele. That's, I don't know if they're ever going to come around to NFTs. I think if right. had I still been in grad school, I would have just been full bore <laughs> into it. Um, 
because a lot a lot of the transparency around the pricing and the market i think for an established artist it's it's very tricky um well i'll say even for for 99 percent of sales it's totally fake right yeah so yeah. It's, it's the illusion of transparency yes <laughs> so many things <laughs> right yeah. yeah but but yeah you know the the technology itself i think is is fascinating um and i've done i've experienced it mostly by making nft projects for other people um one of, one of my friends, Matt Porter, he's a photographer, he is starting a project where he's taking more kind of traditional photographers and having them do NFT projects. And um, just one that I was working on recently was with the photographer and artist Phil Chang, who's a good friend. And um, that's been a lot of fun, you know, getting into the nitty gritty of how like the contracts work and different ways of kind of playing with that system. and you know, the OpenSea SDK and all the things you can do on there. I mean, it's, it's a, it's a fascinating uh, world for sure. I want to, uh, I want to just rewind it a little bit because I'm super curious about what you hear within the circles that you run into be the prevailing conception around NFTs. Now that we've done this big major market cycle, uh, because I think, you know, I, I certainly exist in a bubble where there's almost still total and complete I, end. Mm. I think the art world, there, there's still a lot of skepticism with the people I hang out with, but you can see, you know, like MoMA acquiring things and, and major museums. And I think it is changing. I think somebody like Chris Liu, you know, getting into NFTs and is it Outland that he works for like that, that kind of operation. Um, I think, he was such a major curator at the Whitney. I think people are stopping and saying, wait, and people in the art world, you know, are saying, wait a minute, like there is something here. He's, he's, he's into this. Like we need to reconsider this if, if, if they already haven't. And, um, yeah, it's, it's, uh, a, a kind of, I, I think in some cases a healthy skepticism. Um, and in other cases there is just an outright, like, um, Luddite kind of, <laughs> uh, approach, but, that would be toward any technology. I don't know. The, the art world is, it's incredibly antiquated, you know. Yeah. Um, I, I've just never, and it's something I kind of like about it, but but yeah, it's having worked at Sun at the kind of <laughs> vanguard of technology <laughs> and then going to the art world where there's, everything's done on a handshake. There's no contracts for even your representation right. as an artist. It's um, It's very old school. Well, we were having this conversation with, with Josh um, Citarella and, uh, you know, the, the idea of the, the hierarchy of order, you know, like the in individual, the brand, the platform, the institution. Mm -hmm. um, and art is, of course, a very institutional game. Um, and it's, you know, it, it, it's very hierarchical in that it flows down. And, and this is almost the system in reverse, right? things start to bubble and build up, um, you know, whether organically or, or kind of forced mm -hmm. through different, you know, means. Um, there, I just, I love the uh, relation that they can mm -hmm. present to each other and uh, the, the mirror that exists between them. I think that is super interesting. And I continue to see people that are doing the work um, to lay breadcrumbs for mm -hmm. each side to learn. Yeah, I, I think so too. And I, and I do think the art world, you know, whether it's good or bad, or I'm not gonna make a moral judgment, but it's gonna change. And I think NFTs are gonna have an impact on that. Yeah. Um, you know, I think about it in terms of like finance. Uh, the art world's operating on a kind of financial model that's very antiquated. Um, NFTs are operating on a financial model that's much more akin to like high frequency trading and the, the ways that hedge funds operate now. Mm. Um, all these like looking at signals and making micro trades and trying to squeeze really small <laughs> amounts out of um, thousands and millions of trades and having a technical edge. And I just find that world utterly fascinating, honestly. I think if, if, I, <clears throat> if the art world disappeared tomorrow, I'd go become a quant. Like I think it's just... <laughs> it, it's really interesting and so that aspect of yeah. nfts you know i think it's 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 playing with that game it's playing in that realm a little bit more um whereas the traditional art world is really yeah 
it's like, you know, 1905 still there in terms of how the, the market works. Uh, but I, I, I see elements of those that also speak very much to your personality, my personality, um, you know, interest in, in both and the ability to kind of exist across mm -hmm. both of those spaces. Yeah, that is the fun part, I think. Yeah, yeah the tension, keeping, keeping a foot in both worlds and both worlds and uh, coming out as some kind of third, third entity. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, some sort of a... Oh, yes. we'll call it like Sherpa. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Well, I, you know, we're getting close to the end. I definitely, you know, want to give you last word to share anything that we might have missed, anything that you're working on. Um, yeah, sure. Yeah, so I, I was like supposed that. to, this is a bit of a long story, but uh, I was supposed to have a, a show in New York this fall, but my wife's had a lot of health issues. So everything's just been put on hold uh, since... August really um, she is finally turning a corner and, and getting better so so that's encouraging um, Great. but all that's to say that I really feel like the spring's gonna be a, a rebirth for for her and for me and um, you know my plan is to where, where I'm actually moving studios this week and we uh, remodeled the house and I'll has this really like oversized garage and double height space and we made it into a studio for me so I'm just like Beautiful. thrilled to, to start over in a new space and yeah, I'm working on these paintings um, that will be in a in a solo show, uh, either with Marion Boski in New York or Jessica Silverman in San Francisco. Um, when that's ready, hopefully, hopefully by this fall, this coming fall, uh, that'll be materializing. So, Great. yeah, in the in the paintings, I'll, I'll just mention briefly. Uh, they kind of are I'm trying to do two things in them. Uh, talking about this whole idea of a triangulation and two things making a third. Yeah. Um, so parts of the painting are completely improvised with no reference. So I just sit down and start painting and see what happens and scrape parts out and repaint it. And so there's this very kind of spontaneous quality to parts of the painting. And then other parts are rendered from um, observation. So I might have like, I have some of these bell paintings right now. And so I, I hang like a brass bell next to the canvas, light it, observe it and paint it in that sort of atelier manner. Hmm. And then it casts a shadow into this more spontaneous kind of space. So, so that's really the thing I'm working on now is how to, how to kind of reconcile and create something interesting between these two worlds of painting from observation and painting in a purely spontaneous way. Well, I'm excited to see it. Thank you. Yeah, that'll be cool. Um, Please do let people know where to find you, if you're online anywhere, where they can look at your work, um, yeah. anything like that. Sure. That I mean, my, I have a website with some links on there, and it's just my name, John, with an H, uh, H-O-U-C-K dot com. And then my Instagram handle is at Doshauk, D-A-S-H-O-U-C-K. Wonderful. Um, so we'll, we'll take it home there. We want to definitely give a special thanks to Dementi for putting us together. I'm Colbon Bell of the Museum of Crypto Art, and we were joined today by chart artist John Houck. Uh, and thank you so much. It was a real pleasure. Thank you, Colburn. Really enjoyed it. Cool. Take care. Breaking news.